Okay, what I want to do is take you through a real basic introduction to genetics. We'll touch on mitosis, we'll touch on meiosis, and we'll work through Punnett squares and the three main types of genetic crosses, dominant, recessive, and X-linked. Just, just as a brief introduction to this diagram, what we have here at the top is a normal cell, and it might go through division for two purposes. It might go through it for mitosis and meiosis, so we'll discuss mitosis, we'll discuss meiosis. We'll do some basic terminology over here. The purpose of this middle area is basically to show you that there's not that many crosses to understand. The mother can only have certain types of alleles, allele being a copy of a gene. The father really only has certain types of alleles, and so their crossing over is pretty pretty simple in really simple genetics. And then what we'll do is we'll work through the different Punnett squares so that you understand something called the genotypic ratio, which are what are the possible alleles of the offspring. And we'll also talk about the phenotypic ratio, and that's what is the ratio of the traits. So a genotype is basically what are the genes, and a phenotype is basically what are the traits. So I'm going to start up here just at the top because I want to set the context of a cell. And what I mean by context of the cell is I want to make it very clear that what we're talking about with genes is we're talking about protein products. And if we want to understand how these protein products are divided up into offspring, we have to understand how that DNA is divided up in cells. There's two main reasons why a cell might divide. It might go through mitosis, which is right here. It might go through growth and repair. Or it goes through another process called meiosis. And it goes through two stages of meiosis. Meiosis one and meiosis too. And the purpose of meiosis is a little bit different than mitosis. In meiosis, we're trying to make sperm and egg for reproduction. But coming back here to the original cell, when a cell is just being a cell, it's in what's called interphase. The DNA resides in the nucleus and it's completely unwound. It has to have access to transcription factors and things like that. So the DNA is completely unwound, kind of like a ball of spaghetti or maybe even like a hairball. When this cell wants to divide, it's got to get this DNA into a compact kind of a, move, a unit that can be moved around. And so it goes into something called prophase. And this is kind of the typical chromosome. When we think of chromosome, this is the typical view that we see. We might see this in a karyotype or something like that. So whether you're going through mitosis or mito meiosis, you're going to go through prophase. Let's go through mitosis first. And we've probably done this. You've probably done this a long time ago, early in A&P or maybe in high school biology. But the process of mitosis is really easy to remember if you just remember the sentence, I passed my anatomy test, because the first letter in each of these words is also the first letter in each of the stages of mitosis. So we've got interphase, and this is when a cell is just being a cell. We've got prophase, when you start to wind up the DNA. We've got metaphase, when the chromosomes line up along a plate called the metaphase plate, and this is in, in anticipation of moving apart. We've got anaphase, which I realize I don't have written there, but anaphase is this stage, and anaphase is the stage where the chromosomes start to move into opposite sides of the cell in anticipation of the cell dividing. And I've put a few lines here to depict something called cytokinesis. Cyto means cell, and kinesis means knife. And so this is when the cell is actually knifing apart or cutting apart. We also have telophase here. Telophase is when the DNA unwinds, the nucleus comes back. And we've got two identical daughter cells. So these cells are identical at this point. Let's step down here and go through meiosis. Again, meiosis goes through those same kind of steps. It still has a metaphase, an anaphase, a telophase. It actually goes through those steps twice. But I want to focus on something a little different. So there's a different process in meiosis. If mitosis is about growth and repair, meiosis has two other goals. And those goals are, first of all, we need to get the chromosome number down to 23. And the other thing you want to do is you want to increase some random, you want to introduce some randomness to the genes. The reason you want to introduce this randomness is, is we're all very, very different. We all have very, very different genetics. And that serves as well because if some disease comes along, we might be different in such a way that it might affect some people more than others. And so that's important for survival of the species. Probably the best example would be the Black Plague. Some people were genetically different, so they could not get infected. And so they survived the Black Plague because of that genetic difference. So it's an advantage to the species to have this genetic difference. So that's why meiosis has this genetic difference, introduces this genetic difference. The reason you have to reduce chromosome number is humans have 46 chromosomes. More specifically, they have a pair each of 23 chromosomes for a total of 46 chromosomes. Well, if a sperm still had 46 chromosomes and an egg had 46 chromosomes, when they came together during fertilization, you'd end up with 92 chromosomes, and that would be way too much DNA. We can think about some of the consequences of too much DNA when we think about trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. Well, just a little bit too much DNA has significant consequences. 
So you have to, during meiosis, reduce the number of chromosomes in a sperm to 23 and reduce the number of chromosomes in an egg to 23 so that when they meet during fertilization, you're back to 46 chromosomes. That's kind of a basic introduction to the purpose of meiosis, but let's dig in a little bit deeper so that we can see how we get this randomness and how we get down to 23 chromosomes per sperm or per egg. The first thing to note is the cell will begin in interphase, it'll move through prophase, and it'll end up in metaphase, just as it would if it was going through mitosis. Here's where we begin to do something a little bit different. At this point, we have 92 chromosomes. Now, I haven't drawn all the human chromosomes. I've just drawn a few pairs. And at this point, I want to show that they've all basically replicated. And what they're going to do first is something called crossing over. Crossing over is a process where DNA can actually be exchanged ac across chromosomes. Now, why would you want to do that? The reason you want to do that is, as we said before, we want to make sure that our genetics are all very different. It strengthens the species to have very different genetics across the population. So we're going to talk in a second about how independent assortment helps that because it separates different chromosomes. So there's kind of a random mixture of how chromosomes are distributed into sperm and egg. Obviously, you keep the same pairs of 23 on each side, but it might be a little bit random as far as which direction they go. So you're going to randomize your chromosomes, but you might also want to randomize the genes that are on the same chromosome. An example would be hair color and eye color. Hair color and eye color are on the same gene for the most part. There's some other genes that go into eye color, but the main genes that contribute to eye color are on the same chromosome that contribute to hair color. And we kind of notice that because normally somebody that has brunette hair also has brown eyes, and normally somebody ha that has blonde hair has blue eyes. Now occasionally a crossing over event can mix up those genes. And there are some examples of people that have brunette hair and blue eyes. I think of Lauren Graham. And there are some people that have blonde hair and brown eyes. So crossing over is basically this process where chromosomes can exchange. Now most of these chromosomes I did not show exchange, but a few of them I did. The basic thing that I'm showing here is that I've got blue chromosomes on the left, and I've got red chromosomes on the right. A few of these chromosomes I've shown where they've actually exchanged parts of their chromosomes. They've crossed over, so there's a little bit of the blue chromosome now in the red, and there's a little bit of the red chromosome in the blue. So that's crossing over. The next thing is I've lined all these blue ones up here on the left and all these red ones on the right, but that's not necessarily how they're going to divide. They're going to mix themselves up before they actually move to opposite sides of the cell, and that's independent assortment. Maybe another way to say that is that even though you've got 23 pairs of chromosomes and one side of each of those pairs has to end up in the opposite side of the cell, so you only have one of each type of chromosome on each side of the cell. But other than that, there's no connection. There's not like uh, one side of one chromosome likes to stick with the same side of another chromosome. All the genes are basically, all the chromosomes are independently assorted. So let's go through the next step, and the next step is we're going to actually go through telophase, and we're going to lead back into another set of meiosis II. Now, I didn't draw these all out, but suffice it to say that this cell is going to go through another metaphase, another anaphase, and another telophase, and split into two cells. So the end result of meiosis is you started with one cell, and you end up with four cells. And each of these four cells is going to have 23 chromosomes. In the case of the male, you'll end up with four separate sperm that have a random mixture of all the DNA. In the case of a female, she'll have one viable cell that would become an egg or could become an egg, but the other three are non-viable cells and they become what are called polar bodies. Okay, so that wraps up mitosis meiosis and we're going to move into the genetics now and genetic crosses. 